Let's try again. Okay. Oh, Brandon is here this time. Okay, uh, before we continue our reading of the book, of the introduction chapter, let me have a brief uh, review, okay? So in, the, in our first two weeks ago, we talked about right view. Um, wait, someone requests to join us. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute, okay. Okay, let me go through what we have discussed last um, last meeting, okay. We said that the very important in practice is to develop the right view. And the factors for the right view is two. Do you remember what are the two? The external factor and the internal factor. The external is you receive the right information. Okay, talking about the right teaching. There is about outside. So you need to choose the right teachers or right group of friends or a good book they give you the right information that is about external and the internal is the proper intention proper attention from ourselves if we lack of either one factor then it's hard to build up the right view so when we come to the study group our mind need to be stable enough calm enough mindful enough to continue to continue to learn and practice okay so this is very important first we need to come back to this always always not to be distracted yeah i think now it's better that is the first thing okay so do you think it is easy to cultivate to maintain this stable intention or stable attention? Maybe not, especially if there are too much distractions from the outside, from the external world, from the society, from your work, from your family. That is why it's so important for us to practice mindfulness every day, even though it you only have a brief moment, few minutes a day, and then you slowly cultivate to make it last longer each time. So this is the purpose, the importance of the practice every day, okay? So we, we see all this, we concern about our life, our family, the society, and the world. But if our mind is not stable enough, is not focused enough, even though we have a good intention to help others, but nothing much we can help because without the positive energy inside us, it's hard to go outside because everything is generated, initiated from the inside. You know, we start with the right intention, okay, the right understanding, only with the right understanding, right skill, and right intention, then we can speak properly and then act properly, put out the action to help others. This is the sequence and how the cause and effect work together. And the next point is, Buddhism also talk about non-clinging in the book. You, you know that in the book, I think at the very beginning, in the introduction, we talk about it, the books mention about non-clinging. How can we show our concern, show our compassion to others or to ourselves without non-clinging. This is hard, but it is possible. That is why the Buddha teach the Noble Eightfold Path. That is the purpose. Okay, we purify. That means what is non-clinging? First, we don't get involved or we are not being influenced by our feelings, by our emotions, by our any self, thinking self-taught 
okay and all this mental cooking yeah i will talk about the mental cooking last time mental cooking means all the wanderings the mental telling stories all this will affect the stability of the mind so once we are being interrupted inside it is hard to act response to outside in a very stable and calm way so both internal and external are affect each other so always remember yeah we want to help but first we have to stand firmly that means we have to remind to how to hold ourselves stable enough not to be influenced by outside first that is the way we learn and practice so that is the path you can see from the book i i assume that everybody has read the book from the introduction part the book say the path is about ourselves okay first is to tackle the problem inside first when you we see what is happening in the world is only the manifestation of their feelings emotions that because of their anger because of the anxiety because of the fears and you will all this if we cannot see what is happening inside then when it exploded it explodes very damaging effect to the world outside so when we want to solve problem first have to come back to ourselves to guard the five senses to see what is arise inside and not to be influenced by the the mentality first okay so that is the second point and the third point is buddhism talk about dependence origination talking about cause and effect cause and fruit okay that means what it means it means body body and form and mentality physic body and the mind are influenced each other if the mind is not calm is then your body feel the tense muscle is tense and you might get headaches your stomach discomfort you know all this can be shown in the physic and the further is if our body and mind is not calm is relaxed so when we interact with other people we show all this to other people then it create a tension relationship with others and further it will develop and spread out to the society to the countries this is how the problem become worse so from this cause and effect relation we can see that the very important at the beginning is how to guard mindful of what is in this body and mind before letting all these feeling emotions ideas different ideas exploded okay that is always that is the reason again come back to the path of the practice so keep this in mind and now we can continue um our reading in the book because remember before we go into the practice everything sound is like a concept it's just an idea but when we really put this idea and teaching and observe it accordingly in the reality you can see that all these teaching from the buddha from the teachers are from the realization of the experience okay so now we learn the right of their experience and then we put this into our daily life as well so now let us continue our reading okay um if you have the pdf format you can go to the page maybe page 10 we start with the right mindfulness the point that start with the paragraph saying that right mindfulness is a faculty of the active memory so who in the group any one of you volunteer to read for us maybe we can read the that paragraph you can mute your you can unmute yourself and then read for us maybe tot can read for us then Are you there? Yep, I can do that. Thank you. Okay. Uh right mindfulness is a faculty of the active memory and not a practice of open non-reactive radical acceptance of experiences 
as they arise and pass away of their own accord in the present moment. Some proponents of mindfulness as non-reactive acceptance have acknowledged that the Buddha defined mindfulness as a faculty of the memory, but then claimed that he actually used the term in an entirely different sense as bare attention or non-reactive acceptance when describing mindfulness practice. However, when we examine his instructions for mindfulness practice in context, we find that the function of right mindfulness throughout the practice is to remember the right principles to apply in shaping the present moment. In fact, instead of simply allowing things to arise and pass away, one of the prime duties of right mindfulness is to remember to make skillful dhammas, actions, events, mental qualities arise, and to keep them from passing away at the same time making unskillful dhammas pass away and preventing them from arising again. Acceptance plays a role in mindfulness practice only in the preliminary sense of being truthful to yourself about what's actually arising in your awareness so that you can be ardent most effectively in shaping the present moment in the most skillful way. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, this is very, very important. Okay, before we go further go into at once in our practice, right? Mindfulness is very important. Okay, here, let us go back to the first sentence. It says that the right mindfulness is not a practice of open, non-reactive, radical acceptance of experience as they arise and pass away of their own accord in the present moment. Okay, can, can anybody share your understanding about this sentence, what it means? Well, I can just share that. I mean, from what I see, the distinction is the distinction between um, the way that mindfulness in like some systems like uh, John Kabat-Zinn's mindfulness-based stress reduction talk about um, that as kind of um, non-reactive, um, non-judging acceptance. And from my understanding of the, the term sati, um, that that is much more about uh, memory and, and remembering to become aware of what's happening. So sounds like from my understanding that it's a distinction between kind of um, the, the Buddhist and the, 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 the uh, terminology of sati versus the way it's kind of been now popularized in secular accounts of mindfulness. Okay, thank you. Todd. Can, can you further talk about the non-reactive, what it means here? What do you understand about non-reactive? Everybody, yeah, if you have your idea or comment on this non-reactive, I think this is important. We have to understand what it means by non-reactive. Any input? I think it's just... Uh... Uh, just watching things come and go and not reacting to those thoughts or those uh, bodily feelings, but just being uh, maybe uh, aware of what's going on in your mind and in your body. Okay. Any other ideas? I feel this non-reactive um, term um, is describing some kind of um, overly, um, how do I put this, self-silence or literally non-action. Um, so um, it's almost close similar to being numb, um, totally forfeiting your agency and the subjectivity, um, which might be an overkill. Um, we try to stay um, unprovoked, but uh, we just shouldn't, you know, go to the extreme of being like a vegetable. <laughs> Okay. This is Todd. One other point to me, it seems quite controversial to me given the way I hear mindfulness discussed a lot, which is really this kind of 
um, everything that you're experiencing is okay and equivalent and to not judge that. Whereas it sounds like in this paragraph, the distinction is that right mindfulness is to try to um, enhance the, uh, you know, the skillful dhammas um, so that they are staying around and, and that the unskillful ones are not. So it actually does have this kind of judging or evaluative component to it that seems pretty different from the emphasis that I hear a lot in, you know, popular uh, kind of conceptions of mindfulness. Thank you, Todd. Yeah, actually, that is what I want to point out too, because the first sentence actually is connected with the sentence at the bottom of the paragraph. You see, so non-reactive doesn't mean that we become vegetables, like what Jake said just now. Doesn't mean that we don't do any take any reactions when we see something that should be done. Okay, so if this also related to what we talk about last in the last study group, we discuss about what is the meaning of right and wrong, wholesome and wholesome. If it is something that is right and is proper, and is worth to take action to prevent the damaging effect or the outcome, then we need to we need to react, okay? That's why we, in the, the, the later sentence, it says that to remember to make skillful dhammas arise and to keep them from passing away. That means if it's something good, we have to keep propagating it to keep them from ceasing. But if it's something that is not good, is unwholesome, then have to prevent them from rising again. So what is wholesome and unwholesome? The wholesome or the good is everything derived from the good intention, okay? Non-greed, non-hatred, and non-delusion with wisdom. And the unskillful is everything that is related to greed, hatred, and ignorance. This is the key. And the next is the acceptance. I, I remember, you know, when this acceptance is always come with the quality of being patience and tolerance. We, pay, we, we have to be patience. Without patience, it's hard to accept what is arise, have arise. And then, then we want to run away or we want to react um, immediately. For example, if you see something that makes you feel unhappy, unhappy is a feeling. And before we can observe and mindful of this feeling immediately we react out of the feeling out of the emotions then that is without acceptance without tolerance without patience so at the beginning at the beginning stage to be patient to accept and be a temporary non-reactive and observe mindful that is important i remember and here i want to invite master to further to talk about this because few weeks ago master told me that he said that now they you know many people they don't have tolerance they don't have patience they want to immediately to react this is also from my point of view this is also a a, a, a way that's showing their lack of mindfulness so maybe master want to say something about this acceptance and mindfulness in the practice okay uh, can everyone hear me? Okay. Uh, here we have two important points in this book set. Uh, right now we are reading. One is right mindfulness. One is right concentration. Is it? Oh, okay. Uh, right mindfulness to right concentration uh, according to the practice. Uh, here is something that we talk about. Uh, once we practice right mindfulness processing to right concentration, uh, what is right con concentration have five factors. 
the last factor is called wine pointedness. Uh, wine pointedness is the highest uh, state of the form. Uh, we, we know that uh, what we have uh, to practice is foundation on form and name, means uh, it's the uh, from the five skanda point or from the four element point. This is the form what we have, the physic. And then the mind, what if we have is the feeling, perception, mental formation, and consciousness. All this uh, from Rav to Sattva. This is what we base on uh, to practice right mindfulness to right concentration. So right mindfulness means you pull back to one object and let your mind concentrate, be mindful in this uh, object slowly to make this uh, five senses contact and mind contact less active and cool down and even though to stop the mindfulness run, run into this uh, senses contact and mind contact. Let this object be very uh, uh, moment, right moment to be mindful. This is called remembering to concentration, process to concentration. So uh, the name, what we uh, go to is called Samatha. This is the normal life ourselves. Very difficult to have Samatha, means the, to have absorption in certain point, uh, higher experience than the normal life means I want to concentrate, it always concentrate, it, no, not monkey anymore. That kind of uh, 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 experience we need to process to. So how we can uh, avoid this uh, senses desire uh, and the five hindrances uh, disturb the mind state, it become uh, what we call that monkey mind or we become daydream. How we can avoid that? You need to be very serious and uh, put a lot of time into processing. Let this uh, mindfulness become right. Means become pay attention. Not attention into the five senses contact and mind contact and then uh, bring it into another object. We just want a simple object can avoid this senses contact and mind contact in order the mind become chaos, easy to influence by other object and then uh, get lost. So one pointedness is very, very important in Buddhist teaching. So it have a name called a -A Gata. Uh, so, e agata means uh, one pointedness. It is the highest concentration that uh, the mind can uh, absorb in this uh, form realm. It's not in very profound, just mind only, but it is the mind and body unite with very, very uh, uh, tight, and then it just avoid all this. Uh, 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 lost remembering into something. So in daily life, we call that you can concentrate and easy to concentrate. You have mindfulness and easy to remain the mindfulness in the daily life. Like the scientist, he want to do his uh, uh, observation. He want to do his uh, investigation. He is very easy to mindful in that so that he can uh, discover and the profound meaning of his investigation. So mindfulness is very important in daily life. Somebody born with it, 
somebody is uh, practice and improve it, but normally if you uh, lost desire in practice, your concentration or your mindfulness, that memory is reducing active. And then slowly, slowly, it become turn out into uh, take place by the monkey mind. That is why I uh, talk about practice sometimes is uh, not in uh, knowledgeable understanding, but is in experiential improvement of your own self. A very challenging to this modern life because we have a lot of contact uh, in uh, uh, especially in the electronic contact right now. So people, it's not easy to keep the mind uh, simple. It's just uh, more and more complicated, I want to say. Thank you to this point. Okay. Here is, um, since Master mentioned about the right concentration and one pointedness, I want to uh, come back to the first sentence in the paragraph of right concentration. It says that these jhanas are one pointed in the sense that the mind is gathered around a single object or thing, but not in the sense that the mind is reduced to a single point of awareness. Okay, here the important point is that the, we have to pay attention to is say the mind is gathered around a single object, but not in the sense that the mind is reduced to a single point of awareness. Do you see that? Okay. This is the difference. If we get this wrong, then maybe our practice will be wrong too. Any other uh, question come up from this point? So in your practice, is there anything that you can share of your experience of your practice? Or your understanding about the one pointedness? I, I want to connect this, this point with what the master said just now, because it says that only if the mind and the body unite and balance in a balanced form, then we can, the mind and the body can be sharp and sensitive in reactions. So if the mind and the body is not unite or the mind is focused on something else and they cut off the senses and or not aware of everything, then you, you can see that then uh, the awareness of the other, of the body or other senses is brought out. So this is not the right way, okay? This is not the right way of the practice. Suppose the right way is the more we practice, the more we are alert of what is the changes, but at the same time, the mind and the body can remain the balance, remain balanced, okay, maintain the balance. And here, I also want to go back to the point that Master mentioned just now about the five hindrances. For people who are new to the Buddhist term, okay, I know that in our group, few of you are quite new. So you might not know what is the content of the five hindrances. So when we talk about five hindrances, those are the hindrances that obstruct or hinder the mind from being stable and ease. The five is the greed, or hatred, ill will, and doubt, uncertainty, or sloth and torpor, and sleepiness. All these are the hindrance, hindrances that will stop the mind to be stable, to be uh, focused and concentrated. So the, one, the, way, the, the only way to stop the five hindrances is 
we continue to practice mindfulness, always, always mindful of this body, of the mind. When you see that actually in the practice, there are different antidotes to overcome these hindrances. We will go into this slowly when we continue with our discussion and study group later on, okay? But just keep in mind that the hindrances mostly is not from outside, it's mostly from the inside. The instability is because of all this, the greed, desire, or the unhappy feelings, unpleasantness, and the sleepiness, stuff and torpor that created inside. Okay. And okay. Any questions if you want to ask about the hindrances or how to cultivate? Yeah, please feel free to ask before we continue to the next. Uh, I want to add in one point, uh, mm -hmm. so that may be good for everyone to see the difference. To see the difference why in Buddhism we talk about practice is individual applying. Uh, if we call the concentration or mind, mindful, a lot of uh, uh, activity or a lot of practice can uh, turn yourself improve the uh, concentration or mindfulness. Why in Buddhism we talk about right mindfulness or right concentration? Right in this point is apply to individual because uh, you don't uh, allow the senses contact to exterior world in order to concentrate and mindful. But you allow yourself contact to this body and into the inner mind in order you have the right contact point to pay attention or pay mindful this so-called awareness. So you need to sharpening this awareness by supporting from mindful and concentration, all this is inner purification or inner uh, balance from the mind and make this body and mind very stabilized and yourself uh, develop this, uh, what we call the uh, investigation or insight. So this is called uh, right mindful and right concentration in Buddhism. The yogi, uh, the Buddhist Sangha or the Buddhist member, they always, no matter how big group you have, but once we come to practice, it always, even though we sit together in the group, but we still self-apply an individual process because we always back to this body into the mind. This is called right concentration. It's a very different from you go to the sport or you go to other uh, uh, training. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, this is the difference. Um, this is the difference. I, I want to add some more. Well, every professionals, you have your, every professionals apply their own concentration and focus. You are very focused in your profession, okay? Whether you are engineer, you are doctors, you are scientists, you are physician, whatever you focus on. But all this is outwards. It's to external work, external contact. But when we come to the practice, always remember just to call back, come back to here. So it's about the internal is looking for inward, always guard this body and the mind, always guard the five senses of this body and the mind. That is the difference between the Buddhist practice and the practice of other professions. Okay, yeah. So I think now we can continue. Sima already talked about the paragraph on the right concentration. I think we can go ahead to the next paragraph, to the next well, three 
two, three paragraphs. Okay, maybe anybody volunteer to read for us. We can start from the paragraph, start with once we understand this term. Any volunteers? Venerable, I have a quick comment. Um, uh, this compound translated as point, aga, can also mm -hmm. mean gathering place. Uh, okay. Don Shushu sent us uh, something, uh, some pages talking oh, about yeah. that, and I didn't know if Don might want to um, expand on that. Okay, maybe. Yeah, please, Don. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you have to unmute yourself first. I cannot hear you. We cannot hear you. <laughs> Let me see. Can you hear me now? No? Yes, yes. Oh, okay, okay, very good. So um, a few, a few uh, additions. Um, in the first paragraph where, uh, that we read, the first sentence about non-reactive and radical acceptance, um, uh, a little bit of context may be helpful as to what uh, Tanisaro Biku may be referring to. Uh, Todd made mention of this related to um, MBSR, but it also is um, looking at the uh, work of Marsha Linehan, who coined the term radical acceptance, and also Tara Brock, who uh, wrote a book uh, related to radical acceptance. Um, this is a kind of a common term that's now used in psychotherapy. Um, so I think that uh, he is referencing those things as well, saying that uh, mindfulness uh, has uh, other applications besides just uh, looking at things from that point of view. Um, so I just thought it would be helpful to kind of uh, put that, those terms into context. Um, that's something that we could discuss more, but really that's uh, maybe more related to people who are doing psychotherapy. Um, there is a, a, a reason behind this because some uh, many uh, people who are suffering from uh, mental disturbances uh, of a clinical type uh, are overly reactive and also don't want to accept what it is that is happening and so they become very angry and distressed uh, and uh, actually may go even to the extreme of cutting on themselves or doing things that are self-damaging or even suicidal behaviors but that uh, that's uh, a little bit of a different context um, so i just wanted to make mention of that uh, so uh, people can certainly feel free to make comments about those comments as well. The idea of mindfulness being both something that is in the moment and also remembering is uh, easily resolved by recognizing that we need to remember to be in the moment. Um, so that uh, we need to remember the teachings to bring those teachings into the moment as well, that we call the anusati, uh, the, the 10 remembrances of bringing the Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, generosity, uh, morality, etc., into the present moment so that we uh, don't let ourselves be swayed by uh, other kinds of stimuli that Master was talking about that can lead us astray. So going back to the point of uh, one-pointedness, the um, it's interesting because in a previous uh, commentary, Tanisaro Bhikkhu talked about the difference between ekagata, breaking it down into some different points. And here he's going a little bit further in this commentary about the word ag aga, which um, is uh, a correctly assumed as a as a kind of a gathering place. All this is a very this is not a normal definition. It's it's way down on the list. That's why I included the entire Pali um, English dictionary uh, reference, so you could see that there are so many different definitions of this term. But I um, I don't know if uh, if Pete is with us today. Uh, uh, unfortunate because um, um, Pete, uh, who is a quantum physics guy, 
has uh, has an interesting um, way of being able to pull together seeing a one-pointedness as both something that's one-pointed and also something that is more expanded and gathering. Uh, and I don't know if I can do his uh, definition justice in terms of making sense. Uh, I could hardly understand it myself, so I'm not going to try to do too much with that. But I don't think that there's any discrepancy between being um, one-pointed and focused and also being open at the same time. So uh, because when we are one-pointed and focused on something, uh, if some other stimulus comes to request our attention, we can easily shift our attention without irritability from the one-pointedness that we're doing to be able to shift that to whatever uh, requires our attention to be uh, consistent with our uh, prime directive of being of benefit, of uh, caring about others. Uh, so this is why sometimes people will say, oh, I'm very irritated when I'm doing my meditation and somebody interrupts me. Uh, I'm so one-pointed in my meditation, if someone interrupts me, I get irritated. Well, this is not uh, the right uh, view, because uh, when a person interrupts you in the middle of your meditation, no matter how deep it is, if the, if the right view is there, then immediately the, the, the mind shifts to, how can I be of benefit? How can I help you? Uh, I, am, I don't become irritated because it's just a, uh, a condition that I need to respond to. And if it's not something that I need to respond to, I can just bring my mind back to a one-pointedness uh, or whatever level the person is able to attend to, uh, to that degree the person has that quality. Uh, in the mind. The, the quality of one-pointedness is always there in the mind. It's just a question of being able to cultivate it. And this is why to build on that, there are preliminary stages of uh, coming to one-pointedness. Uh, and this is uh, something that uh, I referenced in my little article about uh, ekahoti, which is uh, a state before the mind builds complete one-pointedness, it, it has uh, preliminary stages involved. And this is why in some of the teachings, the Buddha refers to one-pointedness and then to concentration. And then in other teachings, he references concentration and then one-pointedness. Uh, so it's just a question of at what point the one-pointedness is fully developed. But when it is fully developed, it's not developed to the point where it excludes or becomes irritated when uh, something else calls its attention. This is what I wanted to uh, share. Thank you, Don Yeye. Oh, Don Susu. Okay, maybe I can give uh, examples. <laughs> yes. Uh, talking about how can we be aware of ourselves we don't lose the mindfulness on the body. At the same time, we're aware of what is happening around us. For example, we walk on the street, okay? We're aware of our footsteps. We're aware on the road so that we will not kick the stone or kick something, okay? So we're mindful of the body and mind and body walking. At the same time, we also can hear sounds. We see people around us, okay? Doesn't mean that we totally block out ourselves and don't see anybody, don't hear any words. So this can happen at the same time. We mind our footsteps at the same time we can hear and see what is happening around us, right? That's right, yes. Okay, that is a simple example, okay. Thank you. Anybody, anybody have a comment or questions about this? What mentioned by Don just now? If not, I think we can continue. Okay. Yeah, John, please. You need to unmute yourself first. I don't see the uh, the reading on the screen now. Uh, we need Todd. Uh, Todd, please can you put up the paragraph. Thank you. Do you have the PDF format of the book? It's 
uh, once we understand this term, we can see that the sutta's teachings on jhana are clear and consistent. When using the words body and directed thought to describe jhana, for example, the suttas are not engaging in an esoteric language game where body means not body and thought means not thought. At the same time, the compilers were not blind to their own language when stating that directed thought and ikigata can coexist in the mind. Correct understanding of jhana is crucial to the practice because it supports the premise stated above, that the path is an eightfold path with right mindfulness and right concentration serving mutually supportive and interpenetrating roles. If mindfulness were an open accepting awareness and concentration and awareness reduced to one point with no consciousness of anything outside the point, the two factors could not be practiced at the same time. In fact, they would be incompatible. But when we define the terms in line with their usage in the Pali Suttas, they are not only compatible, but also, also mutually reinforcing. And it's because all the factors of the path are mutually reinforcing that they can deliver their goal. This fact is so important that it's the organizing principle of the discussions in the book. Even though the factors of the path are given in the linear order with each factor building on the one before it, in practice, the factors support, support not only the ones succeeding them in the list, but also the ones preceding them. In particular, right view, the first factor on the path informs all of the following factors, but it can develop from its mundane through its transcendent and onto its final level only when the other factors are put into practice. On their own, the individual factors can lead to pleasant results within the confines of the cycle of birth, aging, illness, and death, but they can't take you beyond the fires of the mind. Only when they work together can they lead beyond all fires to the noble goal of total release from all suffering and stress. Thank you, John. I think this is very true and very practical. So um, the, the content of the Noble Eightfold Path, definitely the book will go into deep uh, into it. But here I want to uh, introduce to those who don't know much about the content of the Noble Eightfold Path, especially like it's about building the right understanding, right view, okay? And then right intention, this is about the mentality and then our speech and body have to be in coherent with what we think. So right speech, right livelihood, right actions, and how to maintain all these wholesome actions and intention is by right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So all these together is the content of the right uh, the, the Noble Eightfold Path. Or to put it in a simple way, it's about the training of our mind, body, and the speech. Or even a simpler way is body and the mind. That's it. Nama and Rupa. Master always say about this, the form and the mind. Okay, So it's really always come back to this body and the mind. And here, it talks about the mundane and the transcendent. I, I put it in a simple way like this. Well, you know, nowadays we, we can learn something very easily from the internet, okay? Once you watch a video or from the YouTube or video clips, you want to learn something. Oh, and when you, after you watch the video, oh, I know it. But this is only by the brand. But when you try to apply in the daily life, you, you might make mistakes. You might not get it right because we don't have it yet. We don't have the experience. We cannot realize it and we are not skillful at it yet. So when we first heard and we, when we first heard and learned about it, that is really at the basic, it's a very mundane level. Only if we keep practicing in the reality in daily life until we are so skillful and make it become part of our life, okay, then and realize it by the mind itself, not just by your intelligence, by the brain remembering, then it becomes something that is imbued in, in into our life that is a different level. It's different from the mundane level. Okay, this is the different how we move from the mundane to the supramundane level. And only able we 
practice, not just by listening, not just by reading, then we can work how the body and the mind work together to lead to the purpose of releasing from all the suffering and the stress. Okay, and I think here I want to ask from, uh, for more input from Master because he always, he's the one who always emphasizes about putting into the practice in reality. So maybe, Sufu, you want to add some more to this? No. Okay, not now. And, uh, and I want to see uh, any of the group that have any comments and your understanding uh, can bring it out, not uh, just uh, get the answer, but uh, maybe uh, some doubt of the understanding can put into that everyone can learn from that. Yeah, we are group discussion and keep your comments. Can I do a brief survey? How many of you practice every day? Meditation? Who are not, or who don't know the skill yet? I do. For those who practice, any trouble, questions? And for those who are not, why? Let me, uh, if I would like to make a short comment. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, so, um, one of the things that uh, always has confused me, and um, it, it's not addressed here, but one of the things that always has confused me is the fact that uh, the, the Eightfold Path and emphasized uh, for everyone is always to start with right view. Uh, and uh, right view and right intention are what we call wisdom. Wisdom is the most advanced of the three uh, disciplines uh, because the Eightfold Path is divided into uh, wisdom to start off with, and then morality, and then concentration. Uh, but oftentimes, another way of looking at the path is to start with uh, the morality section, then go to concentration, and then go to wisdom. So it appears that um, the uh, practice of a right view uh, at the preliminary level really uh, can only be uh, very, uh, very much of an introduction uh, because only through the practice of the morality section and concentration section can a person come back around and then have a fuller appreciation of right view and right intention from the point of view of a greater wisdom. I'm curious as to whether or not other people have uh, found this to be true. It, you have to unmute yourself to, res to respond, yes. I'm waiting for someone to say something. I'll say something. Hi, Danny. So, I, I, I beg Don's point. Um, I think starting with right wisdom or right view is very important um, just because, at least on a mundane level, um, it's very important to know, like, to have some basis of wisdom, um, maybe not necessarily understanding wisdom in an experiential sense, but like 
in a brain sense, it's really important to know what is right wisdom, what is wrong wisdom. Um, because if you're starting your path, you're starting your practice, that is going to be the most useful, the most practical, the most helpful. And then following up with right morality, and um, you can then use right wisdom to know, okay, well, this is, of course, right morality or wrong morality. Um, and then when you develop these tools, along with the other parts of the Eightfold Noble Path, it just becomes simpler to have at least a foundation of right wisdom. Thank you. Very good. And I hope to hear more from others. Gary, Jody, uh, Casey, Veronica, John, Garrick, Singy. Uh, one thing that I struggle with with uh, one mind to, one mindfulness is the able to uh, the ability to uh, be comfortable with shifting my perspective. So throughout the day, I might be like uh, concentrating on uh, outside. So this is not the how you described it. It's not the outside. Anyway, I'm focusing on the outside versus the inside. So like if I'm doing work and then all of a sudden I get interrupted, an email comes in or et cetera. And, uh, and then I get irritated. And I think that's, that's something that I'm, I'm str struggling with. And, and then also when I do meditation, it's the same way. So when I'm in my inward, inward self, I, uh, I get thoughts and then sometimes uh, somebody knocks on my door. So it's like I'm in my office at home and uh, you know I get irritated and here I'm trying to, to practice mindfulness but I see all these emotions come up. Good that you see the emotions, the irritations because you are mindful. Is that once you mindful and realize that then they will cease, they will disappear faster because without mindfulness the feeling or the emotion can last long, maybe the whole day or a few days. But because you have the mindfulness, you're aware of it and immediately, you know, but if your mindfulness is sharp enough, they will cease immediately. But if you're still practicing, it might take quite a while to, to stop, to disappear. That means we suffer from the, from the feeling or from the emotion less shorter time than those who are not practicing mindfulness. Do you realize this? Yeah, I, I think I, I mean I just have to practice more to 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 uh, increase my ability of of I get when I feel irritated I I need to think of that I need to focus on that irritation and then as I focus on that it, it will decrease. Here is something I want to share. Uh, I use the four foundation of mindfulness for practice uh, the, uh, uh, the awakening of myself. So that here is the point. Uh, when we accept uh, and, and receive all the information by our eye and ear, so the eye and ear is very sensitive to make your mindfulness run away or get lost. Uh, sometimes uh, I uh, just uh, get away from all this information and stay in the garden or stay in the lawnmower, you know, just uh, expand my lawnmower into the body so that my body be become God by mindful all the time. So I go to lawnmower very slowly in order to avoid the insect, let the insect or other fox have enough time to run away when this big machine uh, vibration come to them. So that is uh, how I always, you know, when I do garden, I just training and develop the watchful mind. Means I watch my hand move, I watch my footstep move, I watch my 
body move. I watch my, you know, thought from jumping this to that, you know, the thought, you know, so that the mindfulness will cover all this uh, contact in order not let the contact take over the mindfulness process into another object. So this kind of practice is not uh, receiving all the information into the memory, but uh, watchful mind, try to avoid things happen to make this mindfulness get lost or become mindless. So remembering the mindful or you not remembering is called mindless. You see? So mindless is lessless. Mindless is heal, healless. So always uh, become mindful is very challenging in the daily life. See? So sometimes I uh, not come to too interested about uh, education or learning from the book, but I try to uh, watch for mine, watch this uh, uh, bodily, what's going on when this bodily contact to the world, and then the mind is not stay with the body. I always check this. So this is what I want to share with you. When we really concerned about watchful mind, then we are practice. I don't know if it makes sense for you or not, but it just uh, really makes sense to me, you know. So I try to get myself uh, always watch, watch, watch like that. So my mindfulness is like the watchdog, you know, <laughs> take over this uh, very a chaos uh, contact, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I want to say something. Let me talk about, if you stay at Mapa long enough, and especially if you work together with the monastic here, then you can see that we don't practice mindfulness or meditation just by sitting there and doing nothing. There is an inactive way or we call it a very short formal sitting, formal practice. But most of the time, the informal practice is much more important than the formal practice. That means we keep in a very dynamic moving form. Okay, you still can continue to practice and that is more challenging, but there is also a better way to sharpening, to sharpen the mindfulness in daily life. And this is actually more suitable for the city people because most of our most of the time we in an active keep moving form of life. Okay. So for those who stay most of your time, spending most of your time in front of their laptop, in front of your book, yeah, try to do something more active, keep your body active, okay? Otherwise it's hard to practice the balance between mind and the body because you train the mind but not train the body. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm curious because I think many of you um, can, can share. I, I guess some of you have a good experience to share. How, you know, I, I think you want to say something about how is your life go and how challenging it is. Yes, please, John. Um, I, I, well, I was just going to share that um, I have a mentor that I work with and in this conversation today that you've kind of been bringing up and also Don's comments about this person is able to stay very focused on what we're talking about, yet be open to other information at the same time. And I never really recognized that paradox of this person's skill. And um, that's, a, that's a takeaway uh, for me from today that uh, uh, th that's... Um, uh, something I think I'm going to try and aspire to. And as you mentioned, you know, living in the city or just with all the things around us today, so much information, uh, I find it a challenge uh, and an aspiration to uh, keep that one focus. But it helped me to recognize today that, that that doesn't mean, it actually means you can be more accepting of new information if it can be done without irritability, if it can be sh open in a calm way. 
So um, just digesting. Thank you. Thank you. Who else want to share? Can I? Yes, please. Yes, I, um, I, I would like to share my experience of my meditation. Um, usually I, you know, I shut off my phone door. I do not answer anything when I, during my meditation, but sometimes there's, a, it sounds like an urgent phone, uh, or somebody ring the bell or something urgent, then I have to break my meditation. And I, 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 I found out that when I respond to that, um, this, uh, this, uh, disruption, uh, I feel my body was kind of really weak. And, and when I have time to go back, return to my meditation, I have to concentrate myself and take a several deep breaths. And it takes me time to settle down my body and then I can go back to my meditation. So um, is it, this is the right experience? Sifu. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, if anything that uh, talk about uh, going back to meditation means uh, you need to have a uh, very really, uh, uh, clear what object do you uh, put on to when you you are uh, meditation. So meditation is everywhere dynamic or uh, just stillness is called meditation. So uh, once you've been disturbed, uh, finished the, 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 the problem, then you're back to the object. This is called meditation. So the object of the mind can be very fine and can be very rough, like body is a very rough object and a feeling, perception, then a feeling have a half half and then perception just go to the fine object we call the object of uh, memory object of the mind so that uh, and consciousness is a very very fine in the, the, the mindset it's a uh, i cannot deal with that uh, too much because it's uh, not easy to observe and not easy to uh, aware of so I will use the very rough object, we call that the four elements body object. So that uh, no matter where you go, no matter how it's be, it been disturbed and then you get lost from the contact, but uh, once you're done and solve the problem, then you back to aware this body and be mindful to this body. So I always train myself like that and keep my mind uh, uh, not talkative, but uh, mind is always uh, still and and watch like that. Watch what? Watch the body. And still with what? The, the mindfulness still in the body like that. This is uh, my my practice. So my practice in the daily life, so how do you want you to not be much able? time I sit, uh, just uh, uh, you sit there you still, you know, know, but I uh, usually okay. is uh, a large job dynamic with the body. Thank you. Awesome. We still have a few more minutes. Uh, anybody want to share your thoughts or experience? Then Dennis, Jolene, Katrina, Singy, Dollars, Casey, Matt, I'll share. I've, 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 yes? Sorry. Okay. Is it okay? Jolene and then Brandon, okay? Okay. Um, I, with this whole social distancing, um, things that we are practicing in the community, um, I, I found myself having a aversion when I see people face to face. So, because we are being 
encouraged to limit face-to-face, -face, keep our distance. So I found myself the physical distance with people that I'm trying to practice, translate into some emotional distance that I am, that I felt like, okay, you are coming to me. I don't really want to talk to you face to face. So that version, that sense of um, reluctance is arises in my, in my daily at, at work. Um, so we were told that to stay in our offices, that to not socialize with our coworker for like any length of time, just so that, you know, if someone gets infected, we don't spread to the whole office. But, you know, you go, I go to the lunchroom, I go to the lobby, and there are people around, there are people coming in the door. And I found myself wondering, like, why are you showing up? Why don't you stay home? So that is how, how I have been dealing with emotionally this past month. And you have people who come into your office. You know. We yeah yes, and we are trying to use a big conference room so that. But I still have to walk them from the lobby to the hallway to the big conference room, and has to point out like you know some people their sense of physical distance are like some people come close to you. So I said okay, let's keep our social distancing. There's a sign right on the table. You sit on that end of the table. So. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, but it, it's, it's, I think it's tiring mentally having to do this. I think after I go to work eight hours, when I come home, I'm exhausted because I'm trying to keep myself safe and keep others safe and try to wash my hands, try to not touch everything. And I, I try not to be paranoid about everybody. I, I try not to have the paranoia that everybody comes to the door is potentially infected and I'm going to be infected and bring it home. So I think that sense of fear um, also causes a lot of distress on my emotion. So I'm trying to manage it, uh, sometimes not very well. That is the importance of this, the dynamic meditation. Yeah. I, I think this uh, COVID-19 come to this world will reform and change uh, this world's uh, human behavior. It's not the short term, but it will be long process to remind us how to be mindful, to save our life and uh, to be disciplined in order to help others discipline. This will be a very good opportunity to who really want to practice mindfulness. If someone not too care about mindfulness, you still need to be mindful in order to save your own life because this is a reform a behavior for human. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, last before the section ends. Do you have something to say just now, Brenda? Oh, yes. Um, I just thought what was really interesting was the um, part of the book where it said that right mindfulness is not um, just the open, non-reactive, radical acceptance. Um, and that to me was pretty much my, how I defined mindfulness and especially how I try to meditate. Um, so I guess the question is, if right mindfulness is um, a little discriminatory in the sense that you try to cultivate good states while letting the uh, negative or unwholesome states pass, is that something you should strive to practice in meditation or is that more something that you just strive to practice in everyday life? So there's uh, really no difference between everyday life and meditation. So what we practice in meditation, we practice hopefully in everyday life. And what we do in everyday life, hopefully we are able to see that in our meditation so that we can continually improve our practice of meditation and also improve our practice in daily life.
Yes, uh, very right. It's very right. Thank you, Su. You know what? Uh, for me, I'm a monk. You know, already uh, more than thirty years. Uh, how to behave, discipline to this body and the world. You know, and then uh, discipline the mind in order to just uh, fix ourselves into freedom mind free and then not troublesome to these uh, words and then the body action you know so it takes long process you know even though right now come to this very difficult time for our country or the, for the world in COVID-19 but uh, no matter where you put me in I still have very confidence it will be no problem at all for me because uh, I check my my hand put out and then touching, you know, I check my foot put out and touching all the time like that, you know. So that I will see that uh, if uh, you are working in hospital, you are working to help other in the social contact. But you, if you have that kind of uh, self-aware or self-mindful, it totally will confident to yourself not fear and worry too much you know but the society right now it's not much done and um and and process that kind of awareness you know so in the daily life even though they go to the street and protest do you see that uh, how dangerous it is it just uh, the mind jump around by emotion by, by the uh, exterior contact and get lost all the time you know even though the, I see some TV news, you know, in the Paris Met and other two, they're just, uh, mostly the mind is get lost, you know. It's a very, very danger for uh, all of you in this uh, kind of condition, you know. It's not uh, protected and it's not help others. So, I see individual mindfulness training, why monastic is uh, put it into so high value and all the energy and uh, daily expand is uh, put into this, uh, uh, what we call that, the highest point. I see right now, this is the value, you know, this is the, the freedom and this is the, how we can overcome problem. Yeah, I hope, uh, uh, the last uh, word I want to say today is, is encourage you. Uh, Mang is smart. <laughs> <laughs> you really want something in value for mind, freedom, or liberation. This is the way to go. Yeah. So, as, uh, as the oldest person, let me just say that the older I get, the better I look in a mask. <laughs> this is, yes. Dancer, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You are old, you are old. <laughs> uh, thank you, and may everyone be safe, and may everyone be uh, peace and diligent into this uh, difficult moment and uh, we have all the difficult and we help yourself and other. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you everyone. So next two weeks later we'll go into the chapter one. We start chapter one. Okay. Bye Don Yan. Okay. Thank you everyone. I need everyone's help. So Thank please you, come. Everyone. Please come. And please, uh, please share everything that you have in your heart and in your mind when we see each other in two weeks. Very good. Good to see everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.